I just wanted to say before we get started that um, one of the reasons I moved, I, I, I live in Stockton Springs, and one of the reasons that my family moved here and I wanted to live here was because of Sears Island and the surrounds, Fort Point, Fort Point State Park. Um, having a background in, in uh, cultural history, the, the area is extremely rich and it's extremely understudied. Um, there has been some archaeology done in the Upper Penobscot Bay. We'll touch on that, but not a lot. And there's a lot more that is not known about than what has been recorded. And with development and sea level rise, uh, some of these sites are being threatened and being lost before they even can be recorded. So that's kind of where my focus is right now. When, I, when I'm not doing my nine to five job, most of the archeology span I do is pro bono, uh, public outreach and research. I wanna put in plug in for my colleague, Harbor Mitchell, who's been working closely with me these past few years. And we're working closely also with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. But what we're trying to focus on is find historic colonial period sites that have not, have not been recorded and not, not even known about in the, in the area. And he's working from Camden up and I'm, I'm working in the Stockton Springs area, uh, Searsport, um, in that there's enough there to keep me busy for more than a lifetime. So. We'll get started on the talk, and uh, this first slide, I, I love this slide, uh, Paleo-Americans, very first people here, down in mid-Atlantic and in the south, there's debate about who, when the first people came, and it seems to be a, a long time ago. But here in New England, we're pretty lucky because the glaciers were here 12,000 years ago, so we know there weren't people under the glaciers. So these people, were the very first to come in after the glaciers receded. And, and just in this picture, I just, I, I love the, the mammoth <laughs> skeleton in the background and the kids playing on the mammoth. It's just an awesome shot. Um, and it's just kind of imagine what it would be like if you were on a hill, which is now Sears Island, but at, at that time it, it would have been far from the sea. And the Paleo Penobscot River coming down the edges, huge river melting from glacial melt off and that's in the distance and kind of tundra with scrub brush. That's kind of what it would have looked like 11,000 years ago. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, but we'll get started here and let's see how this works. And it works. Okay, Sears Island right here for folks that don't know about it. It's, it's off of Route 1 coming up through here. Sears Port is right down here. This is Cape Jellison. That's Fort Point. We're going to be talking, uh, I'm going to be focusing on Sears Island, but I'm also going to be talking about other areas around the Upper Penobscot that relate to it. Very little archaeology has actually been formally done on Sears Island, and s there's a lot there yet to be <coughs> surveyed and recorded. But before we get started on talking about the archaeology, we're going to go real quick through deep time because Sears Island wasn't always an island. And, in fact, it's only recently geologically been an island. Um, 15,000 years ago, we were under about a mile and a half, two miles of ice. And it was just receding at 15,000 years ago in the highest mountains, uh, Katahdin, were peeking out through the uh, glaciers. And as the ice receded, it pressed the earth down and a glacial post-glacial rebound or isostatic rebound, it's that much weight on the earth literally compresses the earth down 70 meters. Uh, as it recedes, the sea inundated Maine. This right here shows where the glaciers were at what time, uh, 14,400, this is radiocarbon years, 13,000, 12,000, right up here, the glaciers were here 12,000 years ago. This is about when people first started coming in. This would have been a tundra shoreline, and this would have been ocean. So it's kind of, kind of crazy. What even is even more crazier about, about it is, as the glaciers receded, the land sprung back up after the, uh, the weight was off it. And there was about 70 meters less 
of sea level because so much water was tied up in the glaciers. So then within a lifetime, it must have been something to see, the water receded dramatically. And at about 11,000 years ago, this was the shoreline. And I have an arrow pointing here, and there's Sears Island. Sears Island would have been about 50 meters from the, sh uh, 50 meters, 50 kilometers from the, uh, from the shore. You would have had the Paleo Penobscot running down through it. It would have been tremendous uh, river melt water just uh, in the summertime. It would have been pretty awesome to see, but it was nowhere near the ocean. So when we're talking about the very first people that were in the region, we have to realize that the, 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 the land was very, very different. It wasn't just, you know, there was tundra, there weren't any trees, but also the coastline was way out past Matinicus. Matinicus would have been a hill on a coastal plain. And the animals would have been different. Um, well, this is kind of what the, this is a shot of the tundra. If you can imagine standing in, um, Stockton Harbor, looking out over the, uh, the uh, Sears Island, which would have been a hill. It's, you know, kind of a dramatic shot. But the land, the vegetation was very uh, fertile. Uh, it was very cold, very harsh, but there was sages and grasses that could support a lot of uh, unbelievable life. I, I wanted to um, also point out that rocks were being transported by the glaciers and dropped off. Um, this is actually a, a rock that was, uh, I took a picture of on the shoreline of um, Sears Island. It's Kineo rhyolite. It's tool stone and it actually has been tested and worked by Native Americans who knows when. And this flake was taken off it and it's very, very sharp when it's, uh, when you flake a, a, a chip off it, it's as sharp as if you cut yourself very easily on it. This rock originated uh, up by uh, Moosehead Lake area region and um, Kineo, Mount, Mount Kineo. And it was transported down uh, by the glaciers with a lot of other rocks and deposited along the shoreline. And these rocks are very common along Penops, upper Penobscot Bay and they were used by Native Americans for tool stone. Some of the animals that were living here are familiar, not to the region perhaps, but we, they're still around today, caribou and musk ox. Other animals, not so familiar, uh, with mammoth, um, large predators. We would have had uh, smiley dons, which is this fella here. Um, we would have had American lions, about the size of African lions. It was a pretty... Uh, pretty rough neighborhood. If you can imagine the savanna, African savanna, just really cold. Our largest predator was the uh, American short-faced bear. And he would have been around when the Paleo-Americans were living here. Uh, larger than the grizzly bear, much larger, larger. And standing up, he would have been 10 feet or even taller. You can't imagine that he'd be really intimidated by a couple of guys with spears. <laughs> so it's, it's all about respect, I would think, and avoidance. But the most successful hunter were people. And these were the Paleo-Americans, the first Native people that were here, um, ancestors of the Native Americans that are, that are still living here. And uh, very, very specialized toolkits. And, and the archaeological record, the, the, especially in New England, because the, the soil is so acidic, um, the, the organic material seldom survives. But what does survive in the archaeological record are the stone tools. And I have actually, if, if you have some time after uh, the show, I, I have some casts of main uh, uh, spear points from this time period that you're welcome to check out. These are very, very important tools, kits. Um, you can look at this kit. Um, look at any tool within this kit and immediately identify that this is from this very early period because after this time period, the culture changes and the artifacts change. And uh, this type of spear was never made before and never made again. It's called a fluted point. Um, and it has a, uh, a, a flake removed from the base of the, the, the spear point up towards the point to make it very, very thin. And it's a practice that was never done 
after this period, and it was never done anywhere else in the world, which is kind of, uh, f you know, fascinating. Um, you can only do so much with stone, but this is a unique uh, uh, tool technology to the Paleo-Americans. They weren't using arrows. You can see feathers on this. This is a spear shaft, and they would have thrown this spear with an atlatl, a spear thrower. It would have had a very high velocity. And if you notice the spear, this point, is on a fore shaft connected to the shaft. So when you hit an animal with this, the spear comes off the shaft, and you can pick up the shaft and reload it with another spear point. Uh, very effective and um, very deadly. And this is one of the reasons this and a lot of respect, avoidance, and organization is how they survived these, these big predators and big, big herbivores that they were hunting. They were mainly hunting uh, probably caribou, but these other animals were around that had to be dealt with. And here's the uh, flute of points. These are main uh, tool, uh, main, main spear points. And you can see the flake that's taken off the base right here. It's like, if you can think of a, a Greek column with a, with a flute going up the side, that's why they're called fluted points. Um, they're very similar to points at this time period all around the United States and into South America. It was very conservative culture and very widespread. This is why the hypothesis was so prevalent 20 years ago of the Clovis first, where one group of people come across the Barren Straits, populate the entire landmass, because they're using very similar tools. We know now that that's, it wasn't that simple. It was much more complicated than that. Waves. Yeah, many waves. But um, at this point in time, this technology was extremely widespread and was used across the entire United States, into Canada, uh, into Mexico, into South America even. Very conservative culture where, for whatever reason, spiritual or technologically, uh, through technolog technological necessity, tools were made a certain way for a period of time, for a long period of time, with very little um, variations within a very large area. So these fluted points. They're not Clovis points, and Clovis points are named after a site in New Mexico, Clovis, New Mexico, where they actually found these next to mammoths. And they, this is back in the 30s, just before radiocarbon dating, and they realized, hey, these are pretty old. They're very, very similar from the same time period, and um, we would, no, no real change in technology from these long distances. We're not really sure why, except that this is the way it must have been done, and that culture spread, and it, and it spread across the entire landmass. So Holocene comes, and um, about 9,000 years ago, the glaciers are still up in um, St. Lawrence Seaway, up into Quebec, but right here in um, mid-coast Maine, the forests are coming back, and the climate is warming up. And things are, the sea, the, the coastline is still farther, uh, you know, farther out than it is today, um, quite a bit. But if you were inland, you'd have, you'd see um, very recognizable uh, New England as it is today. The hills would look the same. The vegetation would look the same. So there was a, a rapid change. And this is when we get into the archaic period. <coughs> We like to place names in temporal cultures of, of, of periods in, in it with, with the Native American history. We do this so we can make sense of it. Um, this does not mean that the people were necessarily different, but their cultures were different and their tools were different and what they left behind in the archaeological records were different and they can be dated and we can put them in a, in a line in a, in a temporal correlation so we know where this tool fits as opposed to that tool, where this type of resource gathering fits at what certain period of time. And so we have the Paleo period, Paleo-Americans, we have the Archaic period coming in <coughs> and um, these, life is more sedentary, living in village groups, um, this is, this is uh, the um, 
uh, represents what, what we call the, the Moorhead tradition, um, red paint people. There would have been coastal adaptations um, of, of, uh, of gathering, of not just, you can see seals and, and, and great auk, uh, large penguin-like birds. Uh, there also were swordfish hunters um, and um, massive uh, vertebrates of swordfish and, and swordfish bills are found on these sites and you know, 500, 400, 500 pounds of swordfish um, it would have been quite a, quite a feat to take them in, but that's, that's what they were doing. Uh, Bruce Bork, uh, Dr. Bork, is, uh, has done a lot of work on this, on this culture. And um, we don't see a lot of these sites along the coast because the coastline has changed so much. Um, 6,000 years ago, the coastline was still very different than it is today. But there are some sites that have been worked on. One is in uh, Vinyl Haven, Turner Farm. And this is where a lot of these artifacts are, are, that I'm going to show have come from. These are stock photos, but I think these are from Dr. Bork. Uh, slate bayonets, this is all from the Archaic period. Um, a lot of harpoons, bone harpoons. You can see the uh, adaptation to marine resource gathering, uh, swordfish hunting, perhaps sea mammals, seals, fish hooks, bone fish hooks. These are preserved uh, because they were found in shell mittens. And normally in New England soil, bone would not preserve. But if you have a shell midden, the soil is so alkaline that it will preserve organics very well for a very long period of time. And that's one of the reasons why shell middens are so important. The other reason why they are archaeologically is that they tend to be stratified if they're not disturbed. When I say stratified, trash that's put down a thousand years ago is below trash that's put, that was put down 500 years ago. So when you get down deeper, you get older. And when you can date these levels, these soil color changes, you can get accurate uh, dates and um, the tools that are found in that correlate if, if you're lucky. <laughs> About 3,000 years ago, 2,800 years ago, things change again technologically and we come into the ceramic period. Um, ceramics weren't used in the archaic time. Um, and not only the this, not only, it wasn't just the ceramics that changed. Um, the, the cultures changed in, in uh, resource gathering also. Um, one of the, I think one of the most important inventions, even maybe even more important than ceramics, but one of the most important uh, inventions during the ceramic period was the, the birch bark canoe. And that would have been a lightweight canoe. Um, before that, the archaics had wonderful uh, seaworthy uh, boats. But they couldn't be moved very easily. They were very heavy. They were logs. Um, the birch bark canoe can be picked up. And this is, we see this in the archaeological record at, during the ceramic period. Material from far away, from Labrador, from Pennsylvania, from Ohio, we're finding material coming into New England and, and New England material going out. There's a, there's a lot of movement. And I think, the, I, I believe personally that the birch bark canoe has a lot to do with that. Long portages over hills, you could carry the canoe and, and go from the uh, Penobscot River to the Kennebec River, up the Kennebec River to Moosehead, portage, portage in here in Quebec, you know, in a relatively short time. This is a, um, a point, a surface find that was found on uh, Sears Island that's been recorded. Um, it's a wonderful red quartzite point. I don't recognize the stone. Um, it might come from Canada, Quebec. But it's indicative of uh, early ceramic period projectile points, about 2,000, 2,500 years, give or take a weekend old. But it's an it's a, it's a early period of the ceramics. And I'm, I'm saying early, it, it's a temporal thing. You know, you have the archaic, you have the ceramic period. Archaic's not good enough. You have to have, you know, early, middle, late. And then ceramic period, you have early, middle, late. And you just put artifacts and you, you arrange them temporarily into that order. So, so um, this was on the end of a spear and they would throw the spear and kill the uh, that, that would have probably been a spear. Um, but that's another invention that, that came in during the ceramic period were bows and arrows. Um, we don't 
have evidence that we don't know this for sure, mm -hmm. but archaic period, we're still using atlatls, spear throwers, because one of the, one of the coolest mm -hmm. uh, archaic period artifacts you find are beautiful, mm -hmm. ornate, artistic atlatl weights, which go on to the spear thrower to give the spear more velocity, so they would weight. Um, and, and an atlatl is, is just as efficient uh, Sometimes it could be even more efficient than a, than a bow and arrow, um, but bows and arrows are, are are better in more dense type of forage situations. And and when did the bow and arrow come in? It's pretty much re it's, it, probably ceramic period. And here's a ceramic period village site. Um, I love this picture: wig wigwams, n uh, net uh, mending. Um, a midden, where people are working shellfish, cleaning shellfish and throwing their mess down. And this is where you get your shell middens, and these shell middens survive today along the shoreline. If you can imagine, the village would have been in from the shoreline, but as the sea level rises and erosion takes place, these shell middens start to erode out. Um, and you have resource gathering, canoes. This is a fairly large village, but this could have been the, the sandy beach at, at Sears Island. Um, it's very possible sea level rise would be a little bit lower than today the sea level would be, but not that much. So uh, Sears Island was a uh, shoreline, and we see that on the sites. We see shoreline sites along the shoreline at this period, this late ceramic. And actually, this is Sears Island, a shot I took of a um, previously unrecorded uh, shellman site that wasn't there and then came slumpage from spring and all of a sudden the shell appears. I kind of walk around and, and take note of what's eroding out without disturbing it and just record it and record it with a state. It gets a site number so it can be monitored and this, th this is happening all the time so it's really important that um, and I just you know I would just suggest that if, if anyone's walking any shore and finds an artifact that looks significant, you know, once it's on a shore, it's for all intents and purposes lost. It's going to be swept away from the sea. It's definitely out of context. So grabbing it is, is I, don't, I don't know what the rules are in Sears Island, but I, that's, that's not just beachcombing. But what would be very important is if that's data, where it was found, date, and location as, as precise as possible goes with the artifact in a bag and even if you don't want to show it to anybody right now at least it's with it because a shoebox full of arrowheads they don't do any any good for, for to archaeologists or anyone trying to record these sites and um, so if you can imagine that last picture with a shell dump with a village well that's what it looks like eroding out today and then, about 500 years ago, everything changed. Um, if, if, if you can imagine you know, a UFO coming and landing, it, it must have felt that way. Um, and uh, Europeans arrived, coming up, sailing up to Penobscot River. Uh, first the Spanish, then the French, then the English later. And uh, they brought uh, valuable trade items, and we see that in the archaeological record. Um, these are trade beads that were found in the Moosehead Lake area. Uh, European made glass trade beads, um, uh, tomahawk. Um, when we find these artifacts, we call this uh, the um, contact, contact, per contact, contact period site, uh, European contact. And so it's showing Native Americans keeping their culture intact, but trading and using European goods. And it wasn't all peachy, of course. Um, with Europeans came a, a terrible new type of warfare and, and, and disease. And um, a lot of times the, the diseases and the, uh, the decimation of the native population caused instability in the social structure, as you can imagine. Um, there's estimations that uh, along the uh, coast of New England, uh, 80 to 90% of the P 
people living along the coast were killed in a matter of six years. Um, the tribes further to the west were not impacted immediately, so they became more powerful. This is when you start getting Iroquois raids into the region, um, and Europeans, of course, encouraging that with the, with the beaver trade. Uh, beaver pelts were gold. They were, everyone needed a beaver skin felt hat. It was in, in, it was a, in, in the 17th century, late 17th century, uh, a nice hat would cost as much as a carriage in London. So very, very expensive and very lucrative. And uh, that it, it really changed the dynamics in a very short time of the native population, their, their networks, their, their relationships with each other, and, um, and their culture. And you, you can see that clearly in the archeological record. In Plymouth, when the, uh, you know, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 16, uh, 1621 in Portsmouth, they came up, uh, providence of God, the, the, um, it's all cleared, ready for planting. No, it, it was a native village that two years before it was populated and there were still skeletons on the ground when the Europeans came in and, um, and it, was, it was opened up. It's, so the, the um, Wabanaki call it the, uh, the dying time. And we're going into the uh, 17th century, the 1600s, and this is uh, Grand Fontaine's map, 1671. He was the French governor of uh, French Acadia, and he was positioned right here at Penagoa. This is Castine. And uh, that, of course, I put on. That's not part of the map. <laughs> Um, this circle here that I, I circled it is actually the first reference that I can find of Sears Island. And Grand Fontaine calls it uh, Hazelnut Island, and he describes it as nearly cleared and habitable. Well, if you look at Sears Island now, it's not nearly cleared, so that strongly suggests to me that the uh, island was being managed by the native populations um, for perhaps blueberry harvesting or uh, hunting, um, maybe both. Um, so it's the prescribed, you know, land management through burning was, was extremely common and it opened up areas uh, for, uh, during, for, for thousands of years. But Grand Fontaine was in Penagoet. Penagoet came in, um, Dr. Faulkner excavated uh, Penagoet in the early 1980s. Excuse me. It was a site that was eroding into the, uh, the uh, Castine Harbor, um, and um, it, it was excavated and unbe it's unbelievable. This actually, this is still of, this report is still available if anyone's interested. Um, uh, Main uh, Archaeological Society, I believe you can get it through that, or you can get it through any any just search for it. But great report, um, unbelievable excavation of Penagoet. It's was first occupied in the uh, 1630s, went back and forth, French, the English came in, the English took over for a short period of time, French came in, kicked the English out. By, seven, uh, by 1676, I believe, the Dutch came in and, and just wiped it out, burned it down, and that was the end of Penagoet. French were still in the region, but the fort was gone. And this is kind of important to Hazelnut Island because being referred to Sears Island, because there is uh, an interesting account in 1703. During the 1600s, the French and the English, British empires were constantly at war. There's King Philip's War, King William's War. Um, the natives were in the middle of it. Um, up in this region, the natives were mainly siding with the French. Uh, for the most part, but they were always getting the uh, bad end of the deal and the, the worst of the uh, casualties were coming from native populations. But the uh, war was coming on and, uh, on and off almost continuously, but in between war, w they were trading, the, the British and the French. And in 1703, uh, an individual, Penhallow, and, and another one, Atkinson, was sent up from Portsmouth to um, find a Father Golan, who had a Golan, who had a um, a official house, a church, and official house, 
and it was on, uh, the records show that it was on um, uh, Awasa Umkeg, is how it, they were pronouncing it, or Hazelnut Island, so referring to the Hazelnut Island. When, uh, when Atkinson arrives, uh, the, another war is just about to begin, Queen Anne's War. So the French abandoned the site. The site was empty, but he, claimed, he, he records that he saw a large house surrounded by no less than 30 wigwams. And it was on the, uh, Sears Island at uh, some place. I believe it's Sears Island. The evidence strongly suggests that, shall we say. Never been recorded, never been found. Um, so big mystery, where was that? Uh, the 1703, shortly after that happened, Queen Anne's War starts, and uh, it's, it's another, another bloody time for the, uh, for the native population trying to survive between two empires. Throughout the 18th century, halfway through the 18th century, the French and the British Empire are struggling for power and it leaves a kind of a, a no man's land up in the upper Penobscot area. And it's a large area um, north of Thomaston, all the way up into Acadia. The French, after Queen Anne's War, are pushed up into Canada, but the British do not come and settle here because of fear of reprisal. So for about 40, 50 years, the Penobscot have an autonomy of the region, which is kind of unusual. It's, it's, it's quite late for New England to have Native American autonomy on the coastline, and it's because of the, the, the kind of a neutral zone between two empires, demilitarized zone, if you will. If you're ever in Castine, uh, there's a little museum called the Wilson Museum. It's, it's a nice little museum. You can kind of see it in a, 45 minutes, but it's worth a look. Many of the artifacts excavated at um, Penagoet are, I, they're, they're being housed at UMO, but the fort has been eroding, eroding into the water for a long, long time, and residents for 100 years have been gathering artifacts, and many of the artifacts are actually donated to this museum, and, and this is a, a stoneware bottle that uh, it's a wonderful artifact uh, that, that's just, that, went, that was associated with Fort Penagoet you know, 16, 1650, 1660 perhaps, and uh, that was found back in uh, 1892 by a doctor, and apparently he found it in the well of Fort Penagoet, and um, that's there for display, and there's, they have other artifacts there from the fort. Seventeen fifty nine everything changes, uh, especially for the Penobscot in the uh, in the upper Penobscot region. This is a um, 1764 map from Governor Bernard, and it shows Fort Pownall. And here's Cape Jellison to, or to give you orientation. Sears Island, of course. It's a really well produced map, very accurate. Belfast, of course. And it shows a road that was cut from Fort Pownall to Fort St. George's and Thomaston, coming up through Camden, and, and right here you have uh, Lincolnville Beach. This opened up the area um, to settlement, and what, what enabled that was the end of the French and Indian War. The uh, French and Indian War um, came to a catalyst in this region in 1759 when Fort Pownall was built, although it never saw hostility it was, purpose was to plug the Penobscot so the French could not resupply up into Quebec City. And shortly after, uh, General Wolfe of the uh, British forces lay siege to Quebec City and uh, Quebec City fell and the French were out of the picture in this region. But when Fort Pound went in 1759, they didn't know that. So they built this fort to the hilt. And once the French are out of the region, it's open for exploitation. It's the beginning of uh, permanent occupation of continuous New England settlement, colonial New England settlement in the region. It's also the very point, May of 1759, it's the very point where the Penobscot people lost autonomy of their ancestral land. And um, 
uh, pa uh, Governor Pownall came in in, in force. Uh, some over 300 men um, came in with prefabricated uh, logs to build the fort. And uh, he had that, he had the fort up and running. He came in in May and the fort was completed in July. Now, this is Sears Island, but if you notice it's called Brigadier's Island. And that's the original name of it in the British records and colonial American records. And that's named after Brigadier Waldo. And all of this region was, was under control of, well, he owned it. So Waldo's Patton, and he, he owned an unbelievable amount of track of land, and, and including this, this Sears Island. The Penobscot Bay Expedition. But before we, we get to that, the, I just want to say that, and we'll go back to Brigadier's Island. This is what really interests me, is that there's no record of any occupation being here. There's, there's no buildings on this map. This is a De Beers map. There's, this is Cape Jellison coming out, and you see houses in here. So he's recording the houses. There's no houses here, but shortly around this time, the map was made around 1764 and published in 1776. I mean, 1774, excuse me. But a record, record of uh, uh, Eastman's history of Sears Island claims that uh, there were squatters, settlers on Sears Island by 1775. And Records indicate in a census that in 1790, six families were squatting on Brigadier's Island. Six farms. Um, they probably would have been very modest, uh, earth-fast homes, buildings right in the dirt with dug basements to keep your roots from freezing, perhaps plank line. They might not have had stone foundations. Um, it might be very, very difficult to find if just doing a terrestrial survey walking in the woods, but you would, should be able to see depressions. And this is kind of, as an as a archeologist, I, what I look for when I'm looking in an area is in, even in a depression that not, it's not natural, it potentially could be something. We, this, this time period really interests me because it's, it's the very first people up here. And as soon as the large landowners come in, they're just pushed off. And we really don't know about these people. And um, there's no records of them, and, and in some reason, in some cases, it's intentional that uh, settlement is not recorded because landowners come in and the people are pushed off. They're called squatters. They might have had a deed of some sort, but it was no longer valid. And you see that, especially after the Revolutionary War, when land changes hands and, and the area becomes um, big land speculators start coming in and gobbling up large tracts. Right off. The shoreline of Sears Island in um, Stockton Harbor is a, uh, is a shipwreck that is quite, uh, quite significant, and it, it belongs to one of the brigs from the Penobscot Bay Expedition, 1779. The British had a uh, fort uh, in Castine. They occupied it. The, um, the, um, the Americans, the Continentals forces, came up with pri mainly privateers, Massachusetts militia, but there were some federal ships also, and they tried to dislodge the, um, the British. They were doing okay for a time, but they kind of went into siege mode, and once the American forces went into a siege of the fort, it was all over, because all the British had to do was wait for reinforcements, and the British came up with a, a man of war uh, from New York, and um, the ships saw the man of war, and, and, and although the British were outgunned, because uh, the fleet, uh, the, the American fleet was significant, some 40, 40 gunships, um, they panicked, and um, they ended up scuttling all of the ships. Two, two ships were captured by the British, all the rest were scuttled and burned and, and by the hands of the, uh, by their sailors, by the Americans. It was the worst naval defeat up until Pearl Harbor. And one of the ships is the defense. And oh, this is Castine, right? Cape Jellison is kind of distorted. There's Brigadier Island, right? Islesboro. So this is a, a crude map showing the, um, the, the American forces running away. 
and British man of war coming into the region. And this ship is a defense and, sh and she was burned uh, right off the right off of Sears Island. And they, they blew it up. The top of the hole was destroyed, but the rest of the ship sunk into mud. And it was discovered and archae uh, underwater archeology span was conducted in, um, in the 1970s. And uh, this is uh, a picture from Northeast Historical Archaeological uh, Archaeology. And I, I took the picture of the excavation of the privateer defense. I, I borrowed it. But um, it's, a, it's a plan view of the, um, of the excavation of the ship. She was a 16 gun. Let me double check that to make sure I'm getting my facts right. I believe she was a 16 gun brig. Yeah, um, not a large ship by any means, but a significant ship for the fleet. And um, when this was excavated, the preservation was so good because most of the ship is in the mud, it was a uh, lack of oxygen, uh, organics remain, that they were able to find um, the original uh, cooking area of the ship. And they actually found wooden meat tags, which they, archaeologists took a long time to figure out what they were, but um, researching it, uh, there were tags, wooden tags with leather or wire little wrappers and they have initials on them. And what the deal was, was the, um, the, soldier, the sailors would all get their ration of meat. The officers would get nice, you know, nice pieces of meat. The sailors would get not so nice, but it would all go into a common soup. And they would put the meat tag on the cut, throw it into the soup, common practice. And then you get, so you're not, you're not getting anything other than what you are rationed. And these meat tags are actually found in this excavation along with countless other artifacts. Ship is still there. They recovered the guns. If you go to the Maine State Museum, you can see a permanent exhibit of this ship. Um, and then she was buried back with mud to preserve it. And there she sits. It's National Historic Register site. And it's also a protected site, uh, property of the US Navy, because it is a Navy ship. So the war is over. And here comes the land speculators. And we're going to talk, Henry Knox builds a mansion down in Thomaston, but he marries well and acquires much of the Waldo Patton. And he has a tremendous tract of land, which includes Sears Island. Not a very good businessman. Uh, doesn't hold on to it very long. And he starts selling off his assets in 1804, 1809. Some of these names might look familiar. Thorndike, Sears, Prescott. They buy the, the, the island. Henry Knox by the way, in 1797, when he buys the land, he has a manager living on the property in a farmhouse, I would guess, that that site has not been found yet. And he's farming the land, um, growing various uh, wheat, barley. Uh, he has pigs, he has oxen out there. So Sears Island is cleared and fully um, uh, agriculture um, by the turn of this uh, 1800. Thorndike picks up the land in 1813. He buys out the rest of his partners, uh, not Thorndike, I mean David Sears, and Sears Island at that point, and the Sears family have it for the rest of the uh, 19th century. So there's the historic timeline of ownership of the island. This is um, a farm uh, basement, a cellar hole. It's on the Homestead Trail on Sears Island. And this is uh, one of the farmhouses. This farmhouse probably belonged to one of the Sears, uh, probably mid 19th century. And I borrowed this photo from Friends of Sears Island. And it's what the house looked like shortly before it was destroyed uh, in the early 20th century. And if you walk, the uh, Homestead Trail is, is quite idyllic, but well, you can see the massive foundations of the barns. And after seeing this picture, it, it brings it all to life that it was quite a quite a quite a farm. Okay, now we're going into archaeology. Very little has been done. Um, there was a formal archaeological excavation right off the causeway on Sears Island. If you come off the causeway to your left, uh, there was be the, the area is actually eroding now. 
but there is, they have a riprap that try to preserve it. But there was a shell midden there and archaeology was conducted and it was, this is cultural resource management. So it's, it's part of the environmental uh, regulations, um, uh, section 106, uh, federal regulations. And with, when an area is being impacted um, and it meets certain criteria, uh, archaeology uh, can be um, uh, uh, more than suggested, but, but, but can be asserted that archaeology is done to clear the area. And this was done because of a, um, uh, for Central Maine Power had the island and they wanted to put a nuclear power plant in. That didn't work, thank goodness. Then they wanted to put a coal fire plant in. That didn't work. Then in the uh, early 80s, there was a plan to put a, um, a, a, har a, a port on says the back side of Sears Island and uh, cargo port. And that's why the road is there. That road was built, the causeway was put in. Um, it was all set to go, it didn't happen, but the archeology span was done. This is a nice view uh, from a site shot from the early 1981, I believe. But this shows what the causeway looked like before the causeway was put in. So there was a road through and this would have been a Complete, at high tide, it would have been an island. Now, of course, it's not. Um, you can drive out over the causeway, but that's a, nice, that's a nice view of it. That's Kidder Point, the chemical facility there. Some of the artifacts that were found during that excavation, um, it's not a very big site, but it's ceramic period. We have uh, aboriginal ceramics, and we also have contact period sites, uh, I mean contact period artifacts. Um, not a very good picture, but that's a glass bead. This is a piece of ballast flint, European flint, that was brought in and worked by Native Americans. And then you have this really cool copper alloy cat head. It's kind of interesting that they're finding contact period material because it, it kind of suggests possibility of uh, association with Father Golan's habitation, or it could be uh, just a contact period site that's in the area. Um, either, either one is very possible. The other side of the causeway is Kidder Point site. Um, this is kind of a sister site to it. They were excavated at the same time. I have the site report up on the table in the back of the room. That site's a larger site. It's also a shell midden, and um, they have projectile point types um, that uh, mostly ceramic period, but they also have points that are um, representing the uh, late archaic period. So the site goes, the Kidder Point site goes back to about 4,000 years. That's all the archeology span that's been done on Sears Island. Um, 1759 plan, a section of a plan, it's a great big map. And this was, put, uh, this was put together for the Governor Pownall, and it shows Governor Pownall coming in and anchoring and building his fort. There's Fort Pownall. This is Sears Island. This is Cape Jallison and Stockton Springs right next to it. So kind of, I kind of think of them being cut, tied together in a way because the, the, the sites uh, kind of work off each other, some of them. Right here we have a carrying place, and it's a Native American carrying place that the Penobscot people for Oh, a thousand years, over a thousand years, and we've done archaeology, and we can, from ceramic types, we can say that, it, that uh, there's ceramics dating back almost 2,000 years. So for a very long period of time, this, the native, uh, the, the Penobscot people and other native people taking their canoes down instead of coming around these waters, which are very treacherous, they're coming through and carrying over at the neck of Cape Jellison into Mill Pond out, and then they're camping along Sears Island. This is a great place to gather shells. There used to be shell middens all over the, now they're only remnant because of development, but in the 19th century there's reports of shell middens continuously along this area. This is the first place where you could get shellfish coming down the river. So quite significant. You can see this is called Wasa Umkeg, which is the name that we usually attribute to Sears Island. Bright Sandy Beach, which is a specific point at Sears Island. Fanny X Storm suggests that Wasa Umkeg, or Wasa Umkeg, depending on how you uh, spell it, is a, a significant beach because it's where you would land to sight into the carrying place. Well, 
it makes perfect sense. The reason why Cape, Jall uh, Cape Jallison is being called Wasa Mkeg is because Governor Pownall is very confused. <laughs> he has, he's coming in and, and my research strongly suggests that this is a chain of events, it seems pretty clear. He's coming in from Thomaston with his flagship, the King George, and, he's anch and he anchors off into Belfast Harbor and he has uh, four Native Americans as guests. And he tells, and he has their canoes. And he tells the Native Americans, we're here. If you try to resist, you're gonna be killed. However, if you wish to be, you could be part of England. You are now can be British citizens. You can come and camp under the fort and we'll give you all the security and protection as any British citizen of the empire. And just to show that he is really a nice guy, he gives him a whole bunch of goodies. Uh, blankets, uh, dried meat, rum, which is illegal, but he's the governor, he can do whatever he wants. One Native American doesn't have a gun, so he asks for it and he gives him a gun. Powder shot, loads up their canoes, and they take off and he follows them. And he follows them to the carrying place, because he wants to know exactly where the carrying place is. I can imagine that during that conversation, he points over to where he's gonna put his fort, Cape Jellison, and says, what's that called over there? They're looking at Sears Island. They say, oh, that's Wasa Umkeg. Okay, thanks. <laughs> he calls it Wasa Umkeg from then on. He sails up, and the first thing he does is lands, before he lands in force, he secures the carrying place and um, make sure that he has the Cape Jellison, the entire Cape Jellison sealed, and then he lands forces in mass, 300 forces, right at this point right here where the point meets the, the Cape, and they circle around and they clear the, the, the uh, Cape, making sure there's no hostiles, and then they can get going on their job. First thing they do is they put a, before they can build the fort, they put a fortification site there, and a fortification site there. They're called readouts. And their, their defensive positions are also artillery positions. And that's one of the projects that I've been working on for the past five years. In the previous uh, slide, it showed Belfast. Is that the version of Pasa Pasagasawaka? Yeah, there's all different spellings of it. Yes, that's Pasagasawaka, but it's a different version. It's <laughs> a place where you hunt sa uh, sturgeon by light. It, variations especially a name that long. This is from the, from the same plan, and it shows a detailed plan of a, what the log readout would look like. And this, was, this plan was put in before they built the readout, uh, but just before. The first thing they did is we built these, these two readouts. The first one is down um, at the carrying place. The second one is closer to the fort. I'm interested in the readout at the carrying place. It's on private property and it's going to be developed eventually and modern house modern house modern house we are just so lucky that this building lot has not been messed with 100 feet across you can see the carrying place on this shot coming from Penobscot Bay to Mill Pond out Mill Pond Sears Island there's the causeway right Wasa Um Cake placed a site in the carrying place. Makes perfect sense to me. This land is private, privately owned, but the property owner is fantastic. And we have been <coughs> digging up his property for the past five years, and uh, it's starting to come together this year. What's really interesting about this shot is um, we're trying to find exactly where the carrying place is. And, and I looked at the, a friend of mine is, did a aerial, sh looked at an aerial shot. He says, uh, Paul, what, what's up with this cleared landing beach? It's like, oh yeah, I didn't see that before. It's a 40-foot cleared landing beach that was uh, almost certainly cleared by uh, Governor Pownall's forces um, to bring supplies in to the readout up the carrying road. And the, actually, the readout is situated right there. What is the purpose of a readout? It's a defensive fortification. There's different purposes, but they are formal fortifications, outer fortifications of a major fort. So they'd be associated with a larger fort so you could have fallback positions. This one would have had probably two purposes, and it would be a, to block a, a land attack up from the interior, from the, you know, from the interior up Cape Jellison towards, this is uh, Cape Jellison Road, and this is going up towards the fort. 
just this is the oldest road in the in the region. This road was was put in by Governor Pownall to connect the two readouts, which is kind of interesting, just on this non sequitur. So that would have been one uh, purpose. The other purpose that we're just finding out is that it was a battery position. And they had this readout pointing out towards the water. They had this readout number two pointing out towards the water in another angle. So if the French came in, now we have to remember that the, let's go back to this slide. The French were out of the picture within months of this being built, but they didn't know it when they built it. And they were plugging up to Penobscot River, so they were expecting a, um, an attack. So if the French are coming in to attack the fort that's being constructed, the first thing they want to do is to penetrate the river, and then they can bombard the fort from both directions. A readout here firing out and a readout here firing out would um, give some cover to the fort and to be able to keep the French from just coming in and anchoring and firing. It could harass French ships, so uh, it would uh, provide somewhat of a, uh, of, of a, of a firing security crossfire uh, position. So we've been working on this site uh, for five years now, and uh, this past two years is really coming together. Um, we're working on it. It's a public archaeology project. Uh, we work on it a couple times a year. My colleague Harbor, Harbor Mitchell has more time than I do, so he's really been plugging away at it this fall, coming up with fantastic results. Anyone's interested in public archaeology, I'll be happy to give my card out and it's what it is. You don't have to know anything. You just have to be interested and come and do what you want to do. If you want to screen, you want to, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how it works. And um, it's, it's very important to me to have the, to the outreach. This site is recorded with the state. It's National Historic Register eligible now. Um, and uh, we're working closely with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, Leith Smith is the state historic archaeologist. So this isn't, you know, a renegade project. I'm working very, very closely with him on this project and volunteers. And it's pro bono. It's just, I'm not, I'm working, I'm working close with the state, but they're not paying anything. But um, the volunteers are, are everything. We were very lucky last year. We found a ditch that we weren't sure what it was, Palisade Ditch, Latrine, but it was a fairly deep ditch, about three feet deep, and it was stratified and filled with trash. But it wasn't disturbed, it was old trash. And at the very bottom of this ditch is 260 year old trash, and that dates to the fort. So this is a wine or a rum bottle. Um, we've, it's full of bottles. We probably have eight, nine intact bottles. They're broken, but they're gonna go back together. These artifacts, um, very exciting. This is just happening as kind of as we speak this fall. I've been working with the Penobscot Marine Museum in Searsport, and they're gonna take on the material and curate it. The property owner is, is all for that. He's awesome. And it's gonna be, some of these artifacts are gonna be on permanent display in Searsport at the museum, which is very exciting. That's a, uh, also from the lowest deposit, that's uh, the this, this, uh, this soldiers. It's a porringer, um, a, uh, some type of cooking cup, large cup. What's interesting is at the very bottom, we're finding intact deposits, which means that they're throwing the stuff in there. If it's broken, it's, it's barely broken. And some of this stuff, it, this, the, those are just pieces of holding together, but we have the entire cup. So they're throwing perfectly good items away. And the only thing I can think of is just, it's, it's just um, issued issued items that they don't really seem to value that much. And um, we're finding this at the very bottom. On top of this, we have a colonial period homestead that's also on the site. And on, and on top of that, we have a 19th century, 1800s um, homestead farmhouse that was abandoned around 1870. But it's layered and we can, and it's, and it's intact in this ditch. So we don't know what this, we didn't know what this ditch was. And it, it goes about um, about uh, 60 feet, we were following it. And it ended up joining the corner of this. So it is a drain, and it's a drain for this foundation. And considering that the ditch has 1759 material on the bottom, 
and is associated with this foundation. This foundation, although it was reused as a homestead, it was originally a guardhouse that was associated with a readout. And we have a record from Governor Pownell that he designed a guardhouse, a, a log readout, with a guardhouse big enough for 25 men and an officer. And it's a substantial stone structure. It's not very big. It, it's only 12 feet by uh, 28 feet. It would have been made with prefabricated logs that they brought up from Falmouth, Portland. And they put this thing up in two days. And, but it's, it's, this is the very first building in the region. Back to Sears Island and a cute shot. I moved here to Stockton. I've worked many years in this area, um, but I moved to Stockton Springs uh, about 12 years ago. This is my oldest daughter. She's in university now. And, my f and I, I'm, going, I'm going through shots to do this talk, and it's, I come across this one. It's like, this is the first walk I took on Sears Island. This is a month after I moved, and I found this rhyolite scatter where this large rock was broken apart. Um, who knows when? Ceramic period, late ceramic period, 500 years ago, 400 years ago. It's eroded out and it's uncovered from, the, from water action and there were flakes everywhere, chipping debris everywhere. They came and they busted up a rock. This is a period of time of, a, of a, just an everyday nine to five day at the office for a Native American 500 years ago. He's walking the beach, she's walking the beach, finds a rock, breaks it apart, takes the flakes that are usable to make stone tools, takes it back to their house, back to their camp. This was uncovered just because it was November. So my daughter, I of course, made her sit in the cold ground and, and hold the rock and look happy. I, I subjected her to this her whole life. She's, in, uh, she's a freshman now at Wesleyan, if I can brag, and she doesn't know what she wants to do yet, but she's certain she doesn't want to be an archaeologist. <laughs> I went back a year later, season pass, winter pass, spring. That's gone. That's how ephemeral these sites are that are, once they erode out, they're gone, wave action. Some of the larger rocks might have been buried in the sand. Beachcombers might have taken them. Uh, there's people that collect kineo because they're modern nappers, flint nappers. But mo more likely it's the smaller stuff's have eroded out and washed out and, and the site's gone. It's, I couldn't find any of it, which is cons considering the size of rocks, it's, it's kind of surprising. It just shows how quick these things, once they get eroded out, they're, they're gone. So. <coughs> Sears Island, a very, very special place. Um, natural history, cultural history um, to a lot of indigenous people in the area, sacred. Um, what else can I say about it? I, I, it's, a, it's a jewel. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I hope that was worth coming out in the slush and snow. I, I'll be happy to um, take any questions if anybody has anything. I, just a comment on the uh, Wasom King on Cape Chalison. Is, is it Fanny Hamer that wrote the uh, book of... Fa Pernod? Fanny Ekstorm. Ekstorm. But she says that as it means white shining sand, mm -hmm. That first they would see the white shining sands on uh, Fort Point as as they're coming down the Penobscot River, and so that was the first, and they called that also was some case. So, I've heard that, yeah. and I I can't but speak. Uh, yeah, I can't speak to that because that's Fort Point State Park. If anyone has never been there, it's it's. it's it's unbelievably beautiful. And that has a, a, a of course, sand gravelly beach also. So I, I, I can just, the, the, the research I've done and, and the excerpts I've read from her specifically to Sears, Port, Sears Island is that it's the sandy beach where you site in the carrying place. Um, there could be two different, if, it, if it's bright sandy beach, it could be there and there too. Yes. Was there any activity around that cliffside area of Sears Island? Have you found anything over 
not along the cliff area. Um, there's really, it, it's, 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 it's basically high tide right up against ledge. So there, there could have very well have been 3,000 years ago when the sea level was lower, all kinds of sites along the water, but if they were, they were gone. You do find material washed up all through, and, and, and artifacts, stone tools, um, flakes, tested cobbles, it's, it's everywhere. Most of what you find is water-worn, so it's been out, and it's been out for a long, long time. So where it came from is anybody's guess. The most important artifacts to, to bring to the attention of someone, if, if someone finds anything, is, is stuff that is eroding out of the bank, because then you can kind of pinpoint exactly where the material is, is, is where, where the sites are. And I've recorded, this area has been surveyed in the early 80s when they, when they did the archeology, span they walked the entire island, and they found a bunch of sites. And I have added to that, I've, I've doubled the, the amount of sites just walking. And there's more, if I take a walk I know next spring and look at areas that are eroding out, there's gonna be sites that I, I haven't seen before also. So I, I just keep kind of recording them in and, and getting to putting site numbers on them and keep an eye on them. That's basically what you can do. It's not, it's not rebounding, but sea level is rising dramatically, and that's a whole other issue. That's yeah. climate change. But no, this, the, the, the um, post-glacial rebound would have terminated fairly quickly. And um, I don't have the exact, but it, it would have been within a couple hundred years. Geologically, it's like overnight. And the, and the flooding from the glacial melting would have happened first, right? Inundation. Inundation first. Yeah. So if you think, if you, get, if, if, if you can imagine um, putting a, sh uh, a shower curtain down and putting water on a low spot and then just putting your hand on it, it, it would come flow in and you move your hand across the shower curtain and then you lift it up again and then the water will go back into its place. So, so yes, so the, but to get back to the other point, the sea level is continuously rising and it's only going to probably rise even quicker and quicker. Yes, sir. Some years ago, there was a NOVA program on TV describing the red paint people. Yeah. As, uh, I took it as sort of a separate seafaring group from the other natives who settled the area. Is that, do you think that now or not? Or? That's, that's, that's a huge debate, and people that know a lot more than I do are, are arguing the specifics of that. But what it appears, mm -hmm. and what, what Dr. Bork suggests, and I hope I'm, I'm quoting him properly, but I, I, what's, what's accepted at this point is that they were not necessarily the same seafaring people as the, 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 the maritime archaic in, in Labrador. It's, it's almost, it's, it's uncanny, have almost an identical material culture as the red paint people or Moorhead tradition, whatever you want to call them, in Maine. But there's a lot of people that are between at that time period in the late archaic um, that don't have that culture. So these are both seafaring people. What is most likely, in my opinion, is that they are indeed the main Moorhead tradition are Native Americans, but they are, there is contact between Labrador, the North, and the, 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 um, the red paint or the, the main uh, Moorhead tradition in Maine. So not necessarily the same people, but they share similar cultures. And um, it's, it's fascinating and there's, there's a lot, it's a long way. And um, it's really, I don't, I don't think it's really decisively known and that's why so many people are drawn to this particular point in time and this culture. And it's also their mortuary uh, uh, culture is, 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 is very elaborate. Um, you have the, the ochre burials. Um, and it's not just, they, they're not just a coastline adaptation. There is also a, 
an inland estuary, estuary um, river system adaptation. Um, and they're in the um, rivers and byways, Penobscot River, the St. George, Kennebec, they're all the way up into Maine. And it was a very long lasting, sophisticated, and when I say sophisticated, I'm not demeaning other people, that, that other cultures that were before or after them, but a very complex culture and um, and it's in an archaeological record it, it shows up and manifests itself as such and that's why um, it, they get so much attention what do you mean by complex? very um, they're, they're, they're mortuary mm -hmm. sites are laid out in a very 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 specific manner with elaborate um, grave goods um, and, and, and volume. This is what makes them in the, in the 19th and early 20th century so uh, attractive to collectors and to archaeologists at the time. Their placement of their mortuary sites are in very specific places. They're in um, uh, sand gravel, esker type uh, landforms, over drainages, situated next to their village sites but not part of their village sites and it's a tradition that can be replicated over a, a, a large area and um, that's that's what I mean by it. there's a there's a lot of um, cultural material that they're leaving behind that suggests a, a very elaborate th you know spirituality yeah Yeah. Orlin is... But they were really settled. I mean, the, the objects that they had, it seemed like, these yeah. were not people passing through. No, they were very settled. Okay. And those, those are also the more, we call it, I'm calling it the Moorhead tradition, because that's kind of how that's I've been mean. told to, yes. Okay. Uh, Moorhead was an archaeologist in the early 20th century, and he really focused on these sites. And he's the first one to really define them as a separate group and start hypothesizing who these people were, red paint. Um, and Moorhead, in the early 20th century, did a lot of work in Orlin. And there's a lot of sites. There's a lot of mortuary sites that were, emphasis on were, there. Bucksport, you hear stories of when the town went in, um, site after site. <laughs> burial sites, um, and um, it was a long-lasting culture, um, like I said, very spiritual, manifesting itself as being very sophisticated and probably had a, uh, because of sedentary uh, mannerisms, they probably had a larger population, and, um, and these sites now are, are almost all gone because where they, existed is in areas where we tend to go up and, and just destroy, whether it's development or sand and gravel. They're on these high esker, sandy faces along uh, drainages. And there's something I'm not saying they're all gone, they're still there, but to find one now would be a, a real big deal. But in the early 20th century and in the 19th century, there were a lot of them. There's one um, in Orland, right off of Orland, there's a, a, a barn that Moorhead actually took the floorboards off the barn and excavated a, uh, a, a mortuary site in the barn. Mm -hmm. And I believe some of those pictures in that historical society of that excavation, if I'm not mistaken, of the barn and, and the Moorhead working. He'd come in with a group of people and talk to a farmer and give him a few bucks and, and you know, have at it. And he went and he did a lot of digging. Where's the wreck of the defense? 
It's, it's, if you're standing on the causeway of Sears Island and you're looking off towards Stockton Springs, towards Cape Jellison, looking out towards the condos, it's out in the mud. Can you see any part of it? No, it's buried. Okay. It was a, it was a uh, uh, underwater uh, archaeological excavation. And they buried it back. What's that? We observed them doing that. Oh, I wish I did. Yeah. And that must have been awesome. About, uh, just from four, far away. Four, four or five years ago. Yeah, so you know exactly where yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a need to know information, and I don't really need to know exactly where it is. <laughs> yes, sir. What do archaeologists feel about the causeway? Because the causeway really destroyed so much sea life around Susan. I know. I, I, and it, 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 for the cultural resources, um, um, just for the cultural resources, it's ra I'm rather indifferent because there probably wasn't any sites on the causeway. It was a tidal area and access. Um, but I'm very interested if you stand on the causeway and you look on low tide way out in the water, you see a, uh, a stone retaining wall. And um, on either side, Kidder Point and Sears Island side, and I, I find that fascinating, and I'm wondering if that was the original edge of land in the 19th century, or if that wall goes back to the late 18th century. But I'm wondering if that's the uh, imprint or the remnant of the original <coughs> shoreline that was put in. But the causeway, uh, environmentally, I, I, I've heard some bad things about it. And that's, uh, that's as much as, you know, I'm not, well, when I first moved up here, if you went around Sears Island, you would see thousands of starfish mm -hmm. this big. Okay, yeah. And filter feeders. And yeah. it, it just water goes in and out, in and out all day long. Personally, I don't, I don't know how they got away with doing it without putting in some type of Bridge. drainage, a culvert even. No, they're supposed the to, and the DOT ignored that and didn't. <laughs> yeah. They were required to, and they didn't Yeah, because that's... that's and, and now, you, now you have contamination of Stockton Harbor, so, I mean, it, it, of course, it's the chemical plants and the, 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 um, the manufacturing that was all around that area throughout the 19th century doesn't help, but flushing the water certainly does help. Yeah. And Stockton Harbor is a, is a fascinating harbor because it's a very, very deep, deep harbor. So going back to pre-Columbian archaeology into the archaic period, a lot of these shoreline sites are uh, inundated, but in places in Sears Island where it's right up against the um, deep water channels, you have the potential of having very early sites because although the water would have been lower, it still would have been, the shoreline would have still been close. And that's kind of, that's for instance, Turner Farm in Vinyl Haven is like that, it's very deep right off it. So people have been using it for thousands of years because the shoreline was close. Um, so. And it's also interesting that it was called Frank Harbor, while Stockton was Frank Fort. French uh, is suggestive. I, I haven't heard a good explanation why that's Frank Harbor, except if there was perhaps a, uh, a uh, French uh, trading post somewhere nearby. So we can only take one more question. One more question. Yeah. Sir. If you did any research, I grew up in Lincolnville, my family had been there, and that wave that came in right after 1759. Family legends just had it up until the 1920s. The Penobscots were still coming to the coast, and my family has a land down around the Van Gogh Lake in the, in, the, in the mountain, and the Penobscots coming in the summer, and you, you know, do the blueberries, and mm -hmm. get up towards the cross mm -hmm. over their fields originally anyways. Uh, my family just kind of took over. Um, do you have much? I, I'm just kind of curious. It, it seems like 1920 that all came to an end, and uh, there's a, a kind of a family legend of, of my great grandfather getting in a fight with a Penobscot because he got down an ash tree. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until many years later I found out that supposedly the Penobscots had rights to every ash tree in the state of Maine. Oh, really? Um, awesome. Their trees, somewhere 
trees up where I want The brown way. ash. But in your that's looking great. around Sears Island, any of that, is it, you hear any legends? I do, I do. I've, I've done some pretty extensive research on some of the work I've been doing on, on Cape Jellison and talking to um, the residents who do, didn't witness themselves, but some of the re residents are old enough to witness having been told directly by their parents, their grandparents of um, uh, Native American Penobscot, presumably, but could have been um, Micmac, could have been uh, uh, you know, uh, any number of people, but Native Americans using the carrying place on Cape Jellison. And, um, and also using resources on Sandy Point, on Sears Island, gathering grasses. Just because the Penobscot people were disenfranchised, it doesn't mean they disappeared. And, and they were carrying on with their seasonal uh, resource gathering. Um, it shifted. It was all for their own resources. They also were uh, supplying, uh, in the early 20th century, tourist trade for basket weaving and such. Um, and, and also gathering resources, fruits, berries, uh, blueberries. These blueberry barons have always been blueberry barons. Why it ended in the 1920s, I can only put a guess to, but I think it's, it, it, I, th I think it's a pretty good educated guess. There was a, a time period of e eugenics in, in not just around Western civilization, but in this country. And there was a lot of persecution yeah. of Native American people. These, the Abenaki in Vermont were um, completely culturally eradicated. Um, you have the, 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 the Wabanaki in Maine, um, language, speaking their own language, was no longer um, acceptable. Children were, were punished in st uh, state-run schools. Um, and then the eugenics movement, if, if you kept on these traditions, you were viewed a threat um, you had to become white. And, and the Penobscot people kept their traditions, but they kept them close. And I think this is why you see the resource gathering end at that time. It wasn't a good time. Well, On that note, yeah. should we? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.